one. What is up? Welcome back to Football Life Presents the Audible episode 82. I am your host, Randy Hanlon, alongside my co-host, Matt Bushnell, on this Tuesday, December 7th, the 80-year anniversary or remembrance of Pearl Harbor in this country, a day that will live in infamy. But this is not a sad show. This is just a football show where two jerks just talk about football for an hour and a half for maybe a little bit longer, depending on the day. Matt, it's good to see you, my friend. How are you doing? Oh, Randy, you know how it's going in this world of Arizona. It's cloudy today. We're in the low 70s. I try not to complain about the weather too much because, you know, tr- truly, just truly get to uh, struggle through these winters down here. But the important thing is that we had football this past weekend and it wasn't pretty. Not pretty at all. <laughs> Well, thank you for the weather report in Arizona. The rest of the country who lives uh, like me in the Northeast or, you know, even the Midwest does not appreciate your uh, complaints because, hey, yesterday was 55 here in upstate New York, but the snow is coming for sure. Um, but yeah, I'm in the holiday spirit. I got my ugly sweater on. Uh, we're going to have a couple more shows before Christmas, so I'm getting into the spirit. I hope you guys are too. I got some sports stockings up behind me. You guys can enjoy those as well. Um, episode 82, Matt Bushel, before we get into the thick of it here. The famous 82s, there's been a bunch of them. Great uh, wide receiver, tight end number in history of the sport. What do you got for me this week? I'm going to go with, in my opinion, one of the greatest tight ends that ever played football in Shannon Sharp. Uh, I believe a three-time Super Bowl winner and just a fantastic tight end. Could block, could catch, could run. Really elite skills. He'd be a top five NFL pick. The last This last draft, he would have went to the Falcons number four. Guarantee it. And then uh, Bob Pollard's another guy who should rightfully be in the NFL Hall of Fame, but he isn't. Agreed. Uh, we got, I got three for you real quick. Uh, one that before my time, one that ruined my life for about a decade, and one that I, I just enjoyed watching his highlights. Um, John Stallworth, a Steelers legend, wide receiver, legendary wide receiver, and Hall of Famer, wore number 82 in those 70s teams. Uh, and then Jason Witten, uh, I'm not sure any Giants fan when I say that name just wants to hide their eyeballs, but the slowest guy ever, but somehow would pick up every third and long that you possibly could imagine for the Cowboys. Ruined me for a decade. God, I still hate that guy. Uh, and he started on TV, which makes me hate him even more. Uh, and then uh, Dante Hall was the specialty kick returner, wide receiver, a gadget guy for the Chiefs. Uh, I used to remember he had some pretty entertaining kick returns back in the day, and I remember him wearing 82. No Devin Hester. He's no Devin Hester. No, De- I mean, no one's Devin Hester. I mean, that's that's a, you know, he wore number 23 for a reason. That's, that's goat status stuff. Yeah, uh, true. very true. There, there you go. You, you know, throwing you a bone there. Uh, <laughs> but let's start, Matt Bushnell, with our primetime recaps, and uh, let's say uh, Monday Night Football was uh, about as windy and, and cold of a game, unlike your, uh, where you're from in Arizona there, um, that you can imagine. And the Patriots truly embraced it and said, we're not going to let our quarterback from the south, from Alabama, um, ruin this game for us. He doesn't have the arm strength to win this game. So we're going to let him throw a total of three times. And one of the times it looked like <laughs> Josh McDaniels was pissed that he opted out of a run and threw the ball. So uh, the Patriots at one point ran the ball 32 straight times on the Bills. And they win in Buffalo 14 to 10 to improve to eight and four and take a commanding lead in the AFC East. I have serious questions on the coaching uh, decisions in this game, Matt, but before we get to that, I want to get your initial thoughts on this one. It was an ugly game to watch, uh, you know, aesthetically. Um, I thought New England's defense played really well. Josh Allen, to me, has regressed. Um, hard to really tell in that game, but this this was the fourth time this season where we put Josh Allen, you know, Josh Allen's in that MVP category now. We We want to put him there. And this is the fourth time this year they scored under 20 points. To, to me, that's a little bit unacceptable. You, you need to be better. To be fair, if the kicker doesn't miss the field goal, the Bills probably win this game. Or, you know, New England gets a chance. But without letting Mac Jones throw the football, I, I don't know if they get that chance. But, man, we, we take a look at it. And you got to give Belichick credit where credit's due. He does not put – his quarterback in harm's way whatsoever. He won't let him lose him that game at all. And it shows <laughs> two for three for 19 yards. I, uh, man, I, I, I don't know what to say about it. But then you take a look at the flip side and Josh Allen threw the ball, I believe. Um, 
35 times, I think I had the number at. 30. 30 times. And they only scored 10 points. So. I mean, you look at it, the conditions, and they were moving the goalposts around. The wind was whipping like crazy. So the Bills' decision to even kick a field goal, I'm not putting that on Tyler Bass at all no. for missing that. I mean, it's hard to predict what's going to happen. Um, this, to me, comes down to just – the coaching strategy coming into this game it was what won this game to me. Yeah. Belichick before the game was walking out with a Navy midshipman face mask. Mm-hmm. If you know anything about Navy, they run the ball every play, basically. Like, they're 98% of the time running the football. He gave away his game plan before the game even started. And the Patriots ran the ball 46 times for 222 yards and a touchdown. They were committed to this. Their offensive line was good enough for this, and they dominated the trenches on both sides of the ball because the Bills ran the ball 25 times for a yard short of 100 yards. And you could see the difference in the physicality of these teams. The Bills, for some reason, were not prepared for this, and they refused to make the adjustment. I don't know why they didn't stack the box. I don't know why they didn't force Mac Jones to beat them, because that's clearly what the Patriots did not want to do. They did not want to put the ball in Mac's hands, and I don't blame them. I mean, this is what coaching is. It's putting your players in the best possible position to win. But you saw it on the other side of the ball. The Bills threw it 30 times. Josh Allen only completed 15 of those. And, hey, Josh Allen has a great arm. He has a much better arm than Mac Jones has. He can throw through the wind like that. And you saw his ball didn't really have much. It didn't have much of an impact. But what it comes down to to me is that play at the end where he threw to Diggs in the end zone. That was a horrendous throw that had nothing to do with the wind. He did not put the zip on it that it needed to. And even if it didn't get deflected, it was probably getting intercepted in the end zone. The Bills, for playing in Western New York in the cold and the temperatures all the time, do not have the right style of football to be played, especially late in the season. They run a soft sort of offense. They have, you know, they have a quarterback who can throw it all over the place. They have a good wide receiver, but then they cannot run the ball. Their offensive line is meh. I don't think it's great. It's probably painfully average if if I were to look at the numbers. Um, The defense is really good. Now without Tredavious White, we're seeing this reality with them that uh, maybe they can get pushed around a little bit. And the Patriots, to me, watching this game, just absolutely bullied them and said that you guys had a nice year last year, but now we still run the East. Yeah, the Patriots right now, if the season were to end today, and I didn't want to talk too much about the Patriots because it's just, it's painful, but (laughs) they would be the number one seed in the the AFC right now. The season ended today Mm -hmm. and going through New England, I have questions about it because I do agree with you. Buffalo's defense, I think, is it's wildly overrated. You saw New England just match up and just be that physical presence that they knew they had to be. The Bills can't run the football effectively. I I just don't get that. And I think a lot of this Brian Dayball head coaching rumors have taken a severe hit. Um, Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't feel comfortable with him being a head coach for my team going into next season. I just, I don't know. Now it doesn't mean anything really because you want a leader at the head coach position, but, but, but the offense is just kind of, you know, it's not inspiring. I don't love the scheme. And then when we take a look at new England, just the refusal to get to let themselves beat themselves. is just impressive. It's, It's always what bill Belichick does. My question is, I know we're going to talk about it a little bit later, too. Kansas City has picked it up now. Mm-hmm. They are playing a physical brand of football, and they are shoving it down people's throats. They're playing really good defense. If only, if only Tyree Kill can catch a football and not have it bounce off his hands, we would be feeling a lot better about Kansas City right now. Mm-hmm. But to me um B- buffalo's in must win territory now they got to win to get the wild card i do I-, I do think new england set up to win this division now uh, you know e- everything goes through them bill belichick has steamrolled so many people and you know for our good friend ricky velasquez who told us randy that new england was not going to win a game in december well that was short-lived because they just won last night so mm-hmm. Patriots are good. It's a sound football team that's going to play really good football, old school football, and they're not going to beat themselves. So Bill Belichick does. Him and Nick Saban are cut from the same cloth. They are just a step above the rest of the coaching world. And, you know, you think with age they would slow down, but it does not appear that is the case. And I said eight and four earlier, the Patriots now nine and four. 
um, and in control of the AFC East and then, you know, like you said, the one seed, they're six and oh on the road, which is uh, pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, and the Bills fall to seven and five and they have the Bucks coming up this week. So uh, the Bills could be on the brink of missing the playoffs altogether here. That's pretty unbelievable, yeah. but um, this is where we're at. So, uh, all right, that's, uh, that's enough for Monday Night Football. That was, I mean, like I, I, you made fun of the tweet I had last night, but <laughs> I played football in the Northeast at the high school level and I got up for these snow games. I, I absolutely love playing in this kind of weather. Uh, I love, I love this sort of thing. So uh, I got really excited to watch it. I don't, I mean, ground and pound football is one thing, but uh, I, I really did think it was good competition and a really good game. Yeah. The coldest right. game I played in was a uh, Friday night IHSA, Illinois High School Association playoff game. And the game time temperature, I believe, was zero degrees nice. with, with a wind chill of negative 15. It was miserable. So you didn't love it. <laughs> I, I hate that. Anybody that calls that football weather, you're football out of your Yeah, no, that, that is miserable. I am out of my mind. You should know that already. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'd walked out there in those sleeves and then, yeah, you know, uh, I'd probably be standing on the bench uh, frozen after a while. Anyway, Sunday night football time is the AFC West matchup. The Chiefs uh, really stopped the Broncos from getting anything going in this game. Uh, and they ruined my Broncos cover bet. So thank you very much, Kansas City. Um, they went 22 to nine. Let me double check the score on this one, but. Um, yep, 22 to nine. Um, 20 to 9, 22 to 9. I think it was 22 to 9. Yep. Yeah, 22 to 9. And it ended with a Daniel Sorensen pick six of Teddy Bridgewater. And Dwayne Daniel Sorensen's making plays for you. That's uh it's, been, it's pretty alarming. Uh so <laughs> the Chiefs now improved to eight and four. Uh, I believe that they are in first place in the AFC West. And they've won five in a row now. And it hasn't been the offense, it's been the defense that have played really well lately. And the Broncos now six and six. Uh still lingering in that AFC wild card, but they uh you know not really showing you to anything that's really that impressive down the stretch. Year. Um, look, it's been, you know, we expect it to be if the Chiefs are winning five five in a row, you expect it to be the offense, Patrick Mahomes lighting it up and Tyreek Hill and, and, and Travis Kelsey. And it's not, not that. It's really the defense leading the way. They're playing physical football, they're getting turnovers. And they honestly, the Chiefs running the ball, at least they're committed to, to running the ball a little bit more, which I like to see. I think they're better when they do that. But overall, you'd like to see more from the offense at the same time at Bushnell if they could somehow click it all together they are just as dangerous as they have been at any point in the last three years during this run yeah i i know a lot of people are going to talk about you know the, the chiefs aren't doing this and the chiefs aren't doing that but what i like to see is that you know when when, when you're coming together and you're trying to establish an identity um you know the weather's not going to be great in kansas city it's going to get worse they don't really have a reliable catcher of the football outside of Travis Kelsey and, and teams are really starting to trying to take it away so you have to find different ways to maneuver the football but I do like defensively that they've tightened up Daniel Sorensen's actually played really well the past two weeks he kind of got called out said that he could play better and now we're starting to see it so that's a good sign if you're a Kansas City Chief fan M my concern and it's been this way all year Randy is all right you have Tyree Kill, you have Travis Kelsey. You, you lost Sammy Watkins, and for, for whatever that's worth, but they just can't find that other piece, that other guy. You know, we talk about Demarcus Robinson, hoping that he would step up. Uh, you know, Byron Pringle is a guy. You know, he had four targets with one catch. That that's, you know, that, that's that's not going to do it. That's not going to help your cause. McCole Hardman was supposed to be this deep threat. He's only getting targeted one time. So there's a lot of things here for the Chiefs that we want to see them get better at. But the nice thing is we're seeing consistent play from them finally, where they're not beating themselves, they're not making stupid mistakes, and they're actually being physical. They fixed it, which they had to do. So that's encouraging. On the Bronco side, um, I, I love the fact that Javante Williams looks like a really good running back for them. I, I like Javante mm -hmm. Williams a lot. This team just lacks a quarterback. Defensively, I think they're really good, very underrated. Patrick Sertain is just on another level. Um, to be that good as a rookie, it's between him and Micah Parsons right now for rookie defensive rookie of the year. I don't care what anybody says. Those two have both been excellent. I'd probably give the edge to Sertain because it's just harder playing cornerback than it is defensive, you know, than a pass rusher right now. You basically can't do anything as a defensive back. 
Mm-hmm. But the, the Broncos have to get a quarterback, Randy, because none of this else matters. It, it doesn't matter for this team. They could be as good defensively as they want. They could run the football as much as they want, but you're not going to beat teams like the Chiefs, like the Patriots. I wanted to put the Bills there, but, you know, I got to take them out. And, I mean, even the Ravens to a certain extent. You got to be able to be able to put the ball in the air when needed. Mm-hmm. And they haven't been able to do it. And I, I think that's going to be the Achilles heel of this team for such a long time. And I have a feeling this is Vic Fangio's last year with them as well. I, I think they're going to make a coaching change and try to find a quarterback. They're going to be in the sweepstakes for Rodgers, most likely. I could see them being in the Russell Wilson uh, sweepstakes if there is one of those. Um, but yeah, the, a quarterback uh, quarterback upgrade is needed, and you know this is another one of these teams that passed up on Justin Fields and Mac Jones, and they were like, "Well, your quarterbacks are Teddy Bridgewater and Drew Locke. Like, are you really that confident?" And you know, I, I like Teddy Bridgewater. I think he's you know capable, but ultimately he has a ceiling, and it's not a very high one at this point. I mean, he's very good to have as a stopgap, as a transition quarterback, I think for sure. But this is kind of what you're going to get with, with Teddy Bridgewater in a season, uh, a whole length of seasons so um but Patrick Mahomes it, he doesn't look right to me 100% but I think it's growing I think the confidence is getting a little bit better as, as games go on this is the third game uh, in his last six where he hasn't thrown for a touchdown I mean I think in his first four seasons he had one of those games so that's pretty uh, alarming to me yeah. but the Chiefs need to figure this out he's yeah. 15 to 29 for 184 yards no touchdowns in a pick he did have the rushing touchdown but where's the screen game at where why can't Tyree Kill get a ball Tyree Kill had two for 22 and Kelsey had three for 27 well, where are these guys what is going on here um I I think the Chiefs have a veteran coaching staff they have veterans all over the place I trust them in that aspect of it but I need to see them start to play better on the offensive side of the ball until I can fully trust them again uh in the postseason and you know, that's totally possible there's still a few games left in the season here but i need to see that be done before i'm ready to go all back in on kansas city yeah i just like the fact that they have taken this approach to run the football i mean it was 24 carries mm-hmm. so it, it was nice to see that it's starting, starting to see that movement within their offense i do agree with you patrick mahomes it, it doesn't it's not looking good right now but i think with his past success they just have to get a, a threat in the backfield. A lot of teams don't worry about them. Clyde Edwards Hilaire had 14 carries for 59 yards. The, there has to be more to that so you can bring up the safeties. I mean, th- th- these defenses are just dropping back. Now, I'm going to give them a little bit of a break here because I do think Denver is so good defensively. Mm-hmm. And Vic Fangio, for my money, is the best defensive coach in football. I, I don't think it gets better than Vic Fangio defensively. He, he can take a lot of guys and make them look really good. And I think with Denver, we see that. But I agree with you. Chiefs got to find a way to start kicking this offense into a higher gear. Because let's face it, Randy, we both know 22 points is not going to be enough to win in the playoffs. Well, I mean, again, seven of those coming from pick six. <laughs> so really, they only scored 14 points. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, the, the offense, I just it leaves a lot to be desired. And it used to be so entertaining to watch. So I'm still a little... Just, I want a little bit more. That's all. Yeah, that's uh, maybe I'm being greedy. I don't know. But now time to go to Thursday night football. And this is how we always end these segments. But uh, second straight week, both these teams playing on Thursday after Thanksgiving. Uh, it's the Cowboys traveling to New Orleans. And they just handled the Saints. Uh, I mean, really, this game was not that close. And then the Saints get a garbage time touchdown to make the score look a little bit more respectable. But Dak Prescott, 26 of 40 for 238 yards and a touchdown. Uh, and they ran the ball decent, 20 for 146. Tony Pollard continues to look like the best running back on the team uh zeke continuing to look like he's uh, a little bit washed up here it looks just slow uh, and so what happens to older running backs too um overall the cowboys put together a nice performance defensively but i think a lot of that comes down to the saints and their love of Taysom hill i do not understand this i do not know why they paid him so much money he yeah, i think he's a good football player in the sense that he can run the ball he can catch the ball but he should not be your quarterback uh and nor should you be paying him as such uh, Taysom in this game went 19 of 41, 264 yards, two touchdowns, and four interceptions. Boy, oh boy, Sean Payton, you have some explaining to do, my friend. Uh, <laughs> I don't understand it. Can you understand it, Matt? I, I, I don't get it. I There's a lot of issues I have with this team in general with the Saints. Offensively, they're just not very good with Alvin Kamara out. 
Um, and there are two tackles, Ramchak and uh, I'm forgetting the other guy. But 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 that that that's really hurt them. The majority of this year, they haven't been healthy. They've had COVID issues, um, and with Michael Thomas being out, it's just not a dyna- dynamic offense. And the quarterback position, if you don't have a guy like Drew Brees to really elevate a lot of these lesser guys, it it really shows up. It shows up way too often. Um, you got to take a look at this team as a as a contender to be drafting a quarterback soon. If it's not this year, it's got to be next year. I, I just I don't know if they can wait a year. This quarterback class isn't that great to me, Randy. This class feels a lot like that Daniel Jones um, and Dwayne Haskins type of draft without where, the Kyler Murray. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ky- Ky- well, Kyler Murray, yeah. Maybe there's one guy like that in that draft, but probably not. Um, Maybe it's the Geno Smith type of quarterback class. With it feels like the Jared Goff Carson Wentz draft to me. That's what it feels like. Carson Wentz is actually playing a really good quarterback. Yeah, right I can see one of these guys being like Carson Wentz, but I mean, who knows? Okay, I mean that's fair. Uh, maybe that that's how it turns out. But the the Saints just need to. It feels like they need to reboot. I, I wouldn't be opposed to trading Michael Thomas. Um, and, and you know, I think with running backs. I I'm with you kind of on this. If your team's not in contention, you, you, you just try to get what you can for him. Like I, I, I would trade Kamara for some draft capital. I, I would see what I can get. He's a really good running back. He's a playmaker. He would make the chiefs very dynamic. And hmm. it just, it, it, would they be willing to do that? They, you know, that's something that they would have to look at. But to me, I, I think you trade these pieces to get more draft capital because the saints you know, it's been a nice run and it's a lot of history there. And maybe Sean Payton leaves. Maybe Sean Payton decides that, you know, he's had enough time in New Orleans and he wants to go somewhere else. So it might be the perfect time to hit a reset button. Dallas, you know, it, they're just steamrolling to that division title, Randy. I, I don't know if anything's going to stop them. Um, the Washington football team keeps on winning. Um, and, and Carlos Borg, Borges, Carlos, thank you for tuning in. Um, Kenny Pickett from Pitt is is interesting. I know Matt Corral is a very Mm -hmm. popular name among some circles, but to me, I I would have to see more games from those guys. Really, it's next year's class that I'm drooling over with guys like Marcus Stroud that's going to be in there who's just unbelievable. Bryce Young will probably be in there. Yeah, Bryce Young. Yeah, That's going to be a really good class. So, But Dallas... I, I don't know if Washington's got the depth. You know, we just found out today that Fitzpatrick's going to be out for the rest of the year. So really, it's 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 your guy, Tyler Haneke time. So Dallas, that's who's Dallas is going against. Philly's not going to catch them. The Giants, let's just start burying them. They're dead. <laughs> I'm marrying them for three years. <laughs> so really, it's Dallas. You know, they had to win this game. They won the game. They, you know, comfortable lead. I want to say, yeah, they're two games up on the Washington football team, mm-hmm. two and a half up on Philadelphia. So, to me, I think Dallas wins it. But you know, to me, n- n- nothing changed. Dallas is playing, getting those turnovers. They're running the football, and you know, Dak played a yeah, not a great game, but he played okay. Yeah, I think, you know, without Amari Cooper, you see the difference on the offensive side of the ball for the Cowboys. I think Cooper is a real difference maker for them. I think Lamb did play limited, but Cooper came back for the first time since he had that COVID uh, problem. He wasn't himself, really. I mean, two for 41, but once Cooper is more involved is when the Cowboys are truly moving along like what they're capable of. But the Cowboys are still capable of these stinkers. You know, they lost on Thanksgiving Day to the Raiders and they lost the Broncos. Like they are capable of losing games that they should win. So, you know, it's, it's never, you know, it's, it's possible. I mean, the Cowboys and, and Washington play each other this week. So that's going to be a big game for the division. They could really wrap that up with a win this weekend, but we're going to talk about that a little bit later. The Cowboys did what they needed to do in this game. Defense played well enough. Michael Parsons, as you mentioned earlier, is making a case to be the, the uh, defensive rookie of the year. I believe he's got 10 sacks already on the season. He's, he's been remarkable for them uh, and really filled in the, the, the edge spot when <laughs> DeMarcus Lawrence got hurt. So he's been pretty versatile for them all around so the Cowboys eight and four now the Saints five and seven if there's ever a time to blow it up as you mentioned Sean Payton you gotta swallow your pride and just time to blow it up it's just just not working right now for for New Orleans yeah I I wanted to ask you we get a lot of talk of defensive player of the year stuff right Mm -hmm. 
at what point does Trayvon Diggs start entering that conversation? Because he's got nine interceptions on the year. I think he'll be in the running for it for sure. But I look at what TJ Watt has done in, in 12 yeah. games. He's already got 16 sacks. I mean, he, he might break the single season sack record and not even play 16 games. I mean, he he has been unbelievable. Uh, and and TJ Watt, I think, could even get some MVP buzz if he gets the Steelers somehow over 500. I mean, yeah. they, he, they would legitimately have two wins without him. Yeah. Um, so to me, it's TJ Watt running away with it right now. Yeah, no, and that's fair. That's fair. I agree with that. It's a really. I mean, Dix Dix is having a great year. I think he'll be in the in the final voting, um, in the top five for sure, maybe top three. But uh, it's it's unfortunate you're doing it in the year the way to, in the year that of TJ Watt. So, yeah. All right, we're moving on to Sunday now, week 14. Uh, wow, and I cannot believe we're in December now. Matt Ooh. Bushnell, it is it is just flying by these this year here. Um, all right, well, let's get it going. The early games on Sunday, we're going to start with an AFC North matchup. The Ravens uh, coming off of a loss to the Pittsburgh Steelers, and we can talk about that game for a minute, but holy God, uh, they traveled to Cleveland to play the Browns who were coming off of a bye week. But let's start with those Ravens because they played like poop, like they played a terrible football game, um, but they still found a way to come back. Lamar Jackson drives down the field at the end of the game, throws a touchdown that you would assume uh, ties the game. No, doesn't tie the game because John Harbaugh uh, decides I'm going to go for it uh, and I'm going to try to win the game right here now. There's probably a minute left in the game. Um, all fine and good, I guess, but uh, good play design. Again, T.J. Watt, my guy, uh, coming in and just blowing the play up. Lamar has to take a step up, has a bad angle on the throw to Mark Andrews, overthrows him, uh, and that's just like that. Just as excited as you were that they could have tied it up, and just as quick you were sad that they found a way to lose. The Steelers were the team to beat the Ravens 20-19 to and a huge game. The Ravens now 8-4, and four, Steelers 6-5-1, and one. but the Ravens now lose Marlon Humphrey for the season, their star corner. He, I believe, had a shoulder issue, uh, and that's, that's what uh, Harbaugh said after the game and why uh, they decided to go for it. They didn't think they could have gotten a stop, um, which is, you know, the, the Ravens are by far the most injured team in the league still. So 2019 lost to the Steelers. Now the Ravens come around and they get another divisional game against the Browns. Uh, one that they kind of need here to uh, be in the top two in the AFC, but I, I'm honestly, I, the Ravens, I don't know how they keep doing it. Yeah. Um, coaching, you know, that's what it falls back to, um, you know, f- famous 82s that we, you know, we didn't talk about Ozzie Newsome yeah. were number 82 and he constructed this Ravens model that now um, I think the Castro, if I, if I got his name, right. I don't know who the Ravens GM was, but uh, who it is. But he's been in with the Ravens for a long time. He served under Ozzy for a long time. Mm-hmm. So they, they have this philosophy of the type of players that they want on this team. And, you know, I, I, I'm i not going to question it anymore. You know, they know what they're doing. And I agree with Carlos in the comment section. I, I do love the call to go for two there. I, I think that's what you have to do when you're playing with so many guys injured in the secondary. I mean, it's completely ravished at this point. You're missing your your number one corner. You're missing your number two corner, and I, I just agree. So at some point, you you got to get out of there. Whether it's winning or losing, you you let that. You just push all your chips into the middle of the table and you go for it. Um, I have an issue with Lamar Jackson right now, Randy. Mm-hmm. Um, he he threw a terrible interception off his back foot, thrown into the middle of the field in the end zone. You know, the, the middle of the end zone where the most bodies are at. You can't do that at the quarterback position. Lamar has to be better. He's got to play a better brand of football. And I'm not blaming the wide receivers. I'm not blaming the coaching. I'm not playing. I'm not blaming the offensive line. This is completely on Lamar Jackson. He's getting zero blitz and he is making terrible decisions because he's trying to rush everything. Get it blocked up. Figure out what you want to do. You're fast enough to get out and to break that zero blitz. Either that or you got to find your hot route wide receiver. You have to get on the same page with these guys. But th- this just goes, this game shouldn't have been close. I believe what Lamar threw three interceptions this game. I thought it was just two, but I'll double check. Yeah, it, you know, it, it might have been two. I mean, it, it probably should have been three if it wasn't three. But it's just it's, one. Wow. Uh, so it must have been that in the middle of the field. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I know it's one interception, but Lamar didn't play good. 
So he hasn't played well for a few weeks now, and you've seen that. Uh, his safety blanket is Mark Andrews, and you know that too. I'd like to see them try to get Rashad Bateman more involved. They haven't really been able to do that all that well. Um, I guess in a vacuum, I don't hate – the decision to go for two but i think in that scenario you just drove down the field all it comes down to if you win a coin toss why couldn't you do that again as i guess is my my thought is if, i guess you're pointing up to a coin toss you don't want to do that either but um tj watt had three and a half sacks in this game <laughs> and uh blew that whole play up from the very beginning so i feel like if you're giving that tj watt a chance to ruin your day he was going to do it so um now the ravens have to turn around <clears throat> and travel to cleveland to play the browns the Browns, uh, I believe, are six and six, uh, six and seven. They're around that 500 mark, um, but they're coming off of a bye week. Now, the Browns, I mean, they they just reek of average. <laughs> they, they, they are not fun to watch either. So to me, this is a game that the Ravens could use to get right on track here. Uh, but with these divisional games and how the Ravens have played, I can't be, say for sure that that's definitely going to happen. To me, it, it's what's quieter in the locker room right now. And in Cleveland, to me, it just seems like it is such a mess right now with Baker Mayfield and everything that's going on at the quarterback position. Since Odell was released, I guess, there's only been one touchdown pass to wide receivers by Baker Mayfield with the Browns. Odell has two touchdowns. Not blaming this on either or. You know, it could be coincidental but they're not dynamic enough at the wide receiver position and at the quarterback position to absorb these losses. Cleveland's defense is good. Um, it's not great. It's, it's worse than I thought it was going to be. So I think that hurts Cleveland a little bit, but I, I like Baltimore here. I think Baltimore does get back on track. They clean up some of the stuff that they did. I know it's rough going from, TJ Watt to Miles Garrett, that is not going to be enjoyable. No. So they got to clean some stuff up, but I do like the Ravens here. I, I think it's going to be a classic AFC North kind of dog fight here. No pun intended with the Browns, but <laughs> I'm going to take the Ravens here. I'm going to take them 24 to Cleveland's 21. You know, I've been saying something about Odell for a long time and I've been, you know, getting a lot of shit for it, but, uh, it you know, certainly looks like it's Baker Mayfield's fault at this point. And I'm not, maybe Odell did quit. You know, it's totally possible that's, that that happened. But um, certainly looking like Baker's a little bit to blame here. And I think the Browns are a little dysfunctional. I think you have Kareem Hunt's dad posting about uh, Baker, <laughs> Baker again. That's kind of what Odell Beckham Sr. did too. The Browns feel like they are in a spot where they need to find a new quarterback. Uh, I feel like they're going to have, have a lot of talent on this team, and a lot of it has given up on number six. So, Give me the Ravens. I'll say 17 to 14 over Cleveland. I don't know what the weather looks like, but it feels like it, uh, it's going to be a gross one in Ohio. You know, Matt, we committed a brutal uh, mistake on the show. And when I say we, I mean me. Uh, when I create the rundowns, we go in order in which we're supposed to talk about. And we totally just forgot that Thursday night football was a thing. Um, so <laughs> we're going to go back and cover Thursday night and before we resume with the rest of the Sunday games. And we did talk about the Ravens and Steelers. Uh, the Steelers were on the winning side of that game. Uh, they <laughs> are now 6-5-1. Uh, and one. Uh, They traveled to Minnesota to play the Vikings. Kings, um, who lost a game to a team that had not won a game all season. And before we give the Detroit Lions their just desserts, we're going to talk about the Vikings because I want to give Leon all the love possible. We talk about the Lions later in the show. But for now, this is a game between two teams that feel like their season is on the line here. And I don't really love watching either of them. I don't know what other way to say it, but that, but this game, uh, kind of interesting. And also like the two teams super desperate, I feel like could make for entertaining the football. Yeah, I congratulations, Detroit. Woo! Finally, you did it. You did it. I knew you guys weren't going to go winless this year. Um, I don't. I don't even know where to start with the Minnesota Vikings. You talk about just everything I've said about this team throughout the years, and Vikings fans will, you know, I, we have good ones. I, I like Lucas. I like Matthew Nyland, great guys, really great guys. And, you know, I don't want to come off as insulting to them, but I, I do have to repeat what I've said about the Vikings team ever since we started this podcast way back, uh, you know, two years ago. 
they're a gutless, spineless team. And it may not be Cousins. It may not be Cook. It may not be Jefferson. It may not be Thielen. I don't know who. I, I don't know who you want to place the blame on. But for the past three seasons, this team has been gutless and cowardly. They played the 49ers and they let them, they let the 49ers beat them by passing the football only eight freaking times. And the weather was perfect. The weather was perfect. And you let the 49ers beat you by throwing the football less than double digits. And you let the 49ers run all over you. Nothing's more gutless and spineless than that. And then we see them, they let the Trubisky and Nagy led Bears sweep them almost every season. They finally beat them once last season. First time in Nagy's career, he's lost to the Vikings. And, and then you take a look at this Detroit game. Like, it, it doesn't make any sense. You are talent, more talented in every aspect. Your backup should be able to beat this Lions team, and you couldn't do it. So now you're going to Pittsburgh, and guess what? You're probably going against the defensive player of the year, like Randy said earlier, and you're going to be playing against an offense that's got more talent than the Detroit Lions. They have an older quarterback that can't move, but he's still very smart when it comes to the game of football. And you put that on tape. Hey, I don't want to be the prisoner here, Randy, of what happened last week, because we've seen teams look terrible. And then they come back the next week and just completely dominate. But man, that game right there to me epitomizes what I think of the Minnesota Vikings. Now we get Kirk Cousins in prime time, and we know how that goes. So <laughs> <laughs> they they are five and seven now, and if they lose this game, their season is all but over. Uh, I think you know the I I just can't put myself in a situation to trust Kirk Cousins. I think he threw one interception in that game, but he could have thrown three. He had two other brutal throws that were dropped by the Lions secondary. He's just an average quarterback and he has highs and he has lows. And this year he's played pretty well for the most part, but I see, I think now we're seeing him come back down to earth. I mean, Justin Jefferson is unbelievable. Uh, he had 11 for 182 in that game and a touchdown and he should have had more. When mm -hmm. Thielen went down in the first quarter, I don't, there's no, I don't know how Jefferson didn't have 20 catches in that game. He, he, he's just unstoppable. And I think more of that could happen in this game as well, but the Steelers offense actually looked decent. Deontay Johnson came alive in the second half against the Ravens. Uh, Chase Claypool is a nice player. I like him a lot. Pat Fryermuth is just this is another guy that just feels like a Heath Miller retread that the Steelers seem to have these uh, white white tight ends at the fan base <laughs> loves. Uh, I think this is a good a good move for them. And Najee Harris looks like a pretty good running back as well. So I like the Steelers here. I think they're riding high off of that win against the Ravens, and they're going to come in and beat another team who wears purple. Uh, give me the Steelers, 21 to the Vikings, 17. Yeah, I, I, I like the 17 for the Vikings. Um, I, I think it's going to be close. I mean, we could say it's a blowout. I just, I don't trust Kirk Cousins in these games. Give me the Steelers 27 to the Vikings 21. But, yeah, it, it, it'll feel close for a while. There are, I believe... This is week 14. There's four more weeks left of the season. DJ Watt has a real chance to break the single season sack record uh, in, in less than the games and less than a 16 game schedule, too, while we're at it. Because I know yeah, I'm, and the Minnesota's, stats are inflated, but, yeah. Yeah, Minnesota's offensive line is not good. Yeah, and they were missing a lot of guys against Detroit, but hey, you got to be Detroit. And we're going to talk about the Lions in just a little bit. But let's go back to Sunday now that we <laughs> and, and fixed our problem in our rundown. Uh, let's go back to the early window. Uh, we get the uh, Now we go to an AFC South matchup between the Jacksonville Jaguars against the Tennessee Titans. And then the Titans are coming off of a bye week. Uh, we did not get to see them in week 13. But we did see the Jags, or kind of saw the Jags. Uh, they got boat raced by the Rams. They lost that game 37 to 7. And they are now 2 and 9, 2 and 10, I think, on the season. Boy, oh boy, are they bad. But uh, <laughs> uh, the Jags, uh, I, I just wanted more from. I wanted more from Trevor Lawrence. I wanted them to be more competitive in these games, and they're just not. Um, but, hey, 2-10 and 10 now going against the division leader at the moment in the Titans. Uh, any chance for an upset here, Matt, or are you just not buying anything with the Jags the rest of the season? I'm, just, I'm not buying anything with the Jaguars. I, I don't think it's a good football team. I think they're poorly coached. Um, to me, it's just – you see these quarterbacks – 
go to teams. Um, I don't know if since he got lucky with Joe Burrow or, you know, if, if Cincinnati has actually turned it around organizationally. Um, I, I think Arizona ha- had a good I'm not in love with Steve Kime, the talent evaluator and, and making draft picks, but the guts to get off Josh Rosen and take Kyler Murray, not a lot of people would have ever done that. And, you know, he fired Vance Joseph after one season, which, you know, you can't blame the guy for, oh no, sorry, not Vance Joseph. I forget the name. Um, guy, he was from the Giants, Giants defensive coordinator. Oh, um, oh. <laughs> God. I don't I'm like forgetting him. Yeah, but anyways, they moved off of him, and then, um, you know, those organizations are strong, and then you take a look at a team, you know, like Jacksonville, who goes higher, Urban Meyer, the structure is ridiculous, Um, and then what they do is they put Trevor Lawrence in this thing, in this bubble with Meyer, Shad Khan, who wants to be involved in all these football aspects. And he's not really a football guy. And, you know, I, I try to be careful. And when I talk about, you know, football guys and not like a, a lot of it can be muddled because you, you never have to play a down in football, a, a down of actual organized football. It helps a lot, but I, I think you can still know the game, but you don't get the nuances, the emotional ties behind it. And Shad Khan can do all this stuff that he wants, but it just doesn't, it doesn't work when you want to make the decisions. You can't be the final decision maker in, you know, choosing players because you just don't know. You, you don't know what makes these guys, what makes them tick, you know, how to get the best out of them. And, and then you hire a college football coach. It, it was the wrong college football coach for the record. Urban Meyer should have never went to the NFL. Just it's a bad fit. And, and, and then you put Trevor Lawrence in this, the situation, and this is how good quarterbacks get ruined. Like, this is textbook. Well, how to ruin a generational talented quarterback by making dumbass decisions. And this is it. Yep. No doubt about that. I, uh, I would like for Urban Meyer to be done and done, uh, one and done, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen. Steve Wilkes is the name you're trying to think of. Yes. The one and done Cardinals coach, um, not Spags, Carlos, but, uh, you know, that's the guy I thought of originally, but, um, yeah, the, the Jags are just so disappointing. I wanted them to be much more entertaining than they are. And they're just not even fun to watch offensively. And I feel like they have good playmakers and I feel Feel like the you know overall they should be more fun and they're just not so uh titans i don't think a derrick henry return is in, in play for this game quite yet i do think julio was designated to return off the ir so i'm not sure if he'll play in this game but i think he has three weeks to return or be placed on the season ending ir so we could have a julio jones uh come back here the titans are just a better team they're better defense uh better coached Give me the Titans. I do think it'll be close. I think Jacksonville is like annoying with these division games. Uh, give me the Tennessee 24 to Jacksonville is 20. Wow. Damn. I like that score a lot. Um, <laughs> shit. Uh, to be contrarian here. Um, give me. God, give me Tennessee 23 Jacksonville 17. Okay. All right. Well, I think we both think this will be a close game, but Jacksonville is really not going to get the job done. All right, a lot of divisional games this week. Let's move on to the next one, an AFC West showdown that starts at 1 o'clock. This is an early kickoff for a Western uh, game here, but it's in Kansas City, so, you know, not totally – probably a noon start there, I would imagine. But um, the Chiefs are bringing in the Vegas Raiders, who are coming off of a loss to the Washington football team, 17-15. to And we talked about the Chiefs earlier in primetime, so uh, we don't need to discuss that really much further. But the last time these teams met just a couple weeks ago on Sunday Night Football, the Chiefs boat race the Raiders 41-14. to And now Vegas, uh, without Darren Waller, um, looking like they're falling apart too again. But every time the Raiders seem to be falling apart, they come back and they put together a nice little couple stretches of games. But uh, it seems like to me, you know, you lose to Washington in the way that you did. Uh, I felt like they had so many chances to win that game and they somehow still found a way to lose the magic of uh, Taylor Heineke. Uh, maybe that that's the case there. But uh, the Chiefs at home over the a Raiders team that they seem to own. And we didn't even mention this in the other, uh, in the Broncos recap, but the Broncos have never beaten Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> they are 0 <laughs> Five, I believe, also, no, oh, and it's been four years, so oh, and nine or whatever the record is. Uh, 
Oh, and I, um, the, I think Vegas has beaten him once, but it hasn't been too many times. So uh, this is just another team uh, at the mercy of Patrick Mahomes. And I got to say, I don't think I love Vegas that much. And I think the Chiefs uh, are going to roll to nine and four. Yeah, uh, to me, I, I agree with you. Chiefs are going to roll in this one pretty easily. Uh, Kenyon Drake's out for the Las Vegas Raiders. Mm-hmm. That That is huge. Um, it looked like it, it hurt quite a bit too. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, I, and I don't necessarily, if, if you guys get a chance, check out, I'm not sure if it's his Twitter or his uh, Instagram or wherever he I posted it. His Twitter. it. Yeah, it's tw- okay, his Twitter. Um, he calls out the NFL, you know, and, and rightfully so. Because you get these type of tackles from behind and they yank you back. Like they fall on the back of your legs and you're yanking you back and, and it's dangerous. You know, it's a lot like a horse collar tackle in some regards because you're not expecting it. You know, you can't get your body braced for it. You know, you're, you're all your momentum's carrying you one way and you're being yanked back that way. But yet the NFL wants to emphasize taunting penalties. And I, I think we could both agree. We don't want any more penalties, any more rules in the NFL right now because they can't get these ones right. Like I, I saw so many botched pass interference, non-pass interference calls this past week. It just made me want to puke. But uh, honestly, I, I, I think it's time where we start burying the Las Vegas Raiders. I, I don't think they can come back from this. I think it's just too much. Um, all these injuries, all this turmoil, I do like what Passaccia has done with the Raiders. I mean, hats off to that guy having to fill in for such dysfunction under Mark Davis and then John Gruden's emails. And and also, you know, I think you have to give kudos to Derek Carr for trying to keep all this together. It, it's good leadership by these two. And I think Passaccia mm-hmm. actually might and, and maybe deserves another shot to do this again mm-hmm. next year. Um, I, I don't think he's hurt his chances, but they're not beating Kansas City. Th- th- that's just not happening. Kansas City 34 to the Raiders 21. I mean, I think Derek Carr has been really good this year, and I don't think it's going to get enough love. But, no. you know, I just think he's been really good for a while. And, you know, with all the turmoil surrounding the Raiders this year, with everything that happened to them, uh, he's been really steady and kind of kept these guys in gear and focused. And, you know, then you lose Derek and Waller and they lose Kenny and Drake and you're throwing the ball to Zay Jones and it's just it's a lot of Hunter Renfro it's just not the ideal situation and, and Carr continues to just show up and, and and be the the best possible leader he could be I wouldn't be surprised if they they moved on from him in the offseason just to get him out of the spot uh, to get him in a better situation like I feel like the, the Steelers would be a good place for him uh, the fan base would really love him a lot but We'll see what happens. He could be a career Raider too. I can also see that, but uh, I do think it's a bad spot for them. I think Kansas city wins. I don't know if the offense gets wrong, but they did win 41 to 14. So I'm going to lean on the side of optimism here for the chiefs. Give me them 30 to 20 over Vegas. All right, we're moving on. It's staying in the early window here. Uh, the New Orleans Saints uh, traveling to MetLife Stadium to play the New York Jets. Um, the Saints, we talked about a little bit here uh, that Thursday night recap. They lost, coming off of the loss to the Cowboys. They're actually coming off, of, I think, three straight losses uh, to Philly and to uh, Buffalo and now to Dallas. And they travel to the Jets. The Jets are five and a half point underdogs in this game. I believe I saw that they have been underdogs in 25 straight games. Uh, uh, that's pretty remarkable. Uh, I think that spans over the last three seasons. Sorry, Jacob. Uh, sorry, Jacob. Indeed. I love you, buddy. Uh, so, but if there's optimism for the Jets, I think you could say Zach Wilson probably had the best game so far of his career. I, I think the bar was low, but I think overall he put together the best performance. I think a lot of Jets fans wanted to see him come out and play well from the start of the game. I think he did that. Uh, I think there is improvement uh, there from the week before. I want to see him continue to build off of that because, you know, one start, that's good. You know, that doesn't mean a ton if you don't build off of it. So the Saints now five and seven, they need to win in the worst way. And the Jets, um, yeah, you know, for confidence, yeah, I think Salah and the rest of the team would like a win here too. So uh, I'm kind of leaning the Jets. I kind of, I don't like where New Orleans is in this spot. Normally I would agree with you um, in situations like these. But I don't see it. I think New Orleans is going to be able to do enough to get the win here. Um, Zach Wilson played a really nice game against a Philly defense that's been kind of sporadic. And, you know, let's face it, Philly ran away with the game early. Um, You know, they didn't leave much in doubt. 
I, I think the game's going to be close throughout. I don't think that with Corey Davis being hurt now, you know, that puts a lot of pressure on Elijah Moore, Jameson. Crowder. Who's been great, by the way. Yeah, yeah. No, Elijah Moore has turned out to be a real, really good player for them. And I think when we take a look at this game, you know, kind of like what I talked about with Darnell Mooney with Allen Robinson being out, you know, is Elijah Moore showing signs of being a one? Uh, you might. This game will show a little bit more, but I, I like the Saints here. I think the Saints are just a better overall. I, I think they're better coached because Sean Payne's just been doing it longer. So I, I'm going to mm-hmm. give the edge to the Super Bowl winning coach. And then I think the talent overall, New Orleans defense is still pretty good. They can still line up and get to you. So I'm going to take the Saints 20 to the Jets 17. You know, I was hoping that New York City was going to be pretty bad weather on Sunday, but it actually looks like the Saints are going to get lucky with temperatures in the 50s <laughs> in the New York <laughs> metropolitan. Uh, but, hey, 50s is probably freezing for a team that plays in a dome in New Orleans, often in a temperature-controlled building. Um, but if Alvin Kamara comes back, I could see how that being a pretty big impact. The Jets' defense is just horrendous. <laughs> it's, yeah. It is not good. I mean, they let Gardner Minshew score on every single drive. I'm pretty sure I don't think the Eagles punted a single time in that game. Um, and, you know, I, I – I, I think there's a lot of criticism of Salah with that aspect because he's a defensive minded coach, but you got to think CJ Mosley got hurt. Marcus may got hurt. They need some talent on that side of the ball and they don't have a ton of it right now. So I'm cutting them some slack there. With that said, I just don't like where the saints are. I don't like Taysom Hill at all. Even if Kamara comes back, I don't care. I don't know how much of a difference that he makes. Um, Give me the jets. I think the jets are poised to make another upset here. And if if the saints are going to come out here and just lose, you know, lose out, which I think is possible. um, Then that's part of it. So give me the jets. I like them in the upset. Uh, Give me the jets 23 to the saints, 21 on the last second field goal and the jet and your boy, you're the eighth kicker for the jets, Eddie Pinheiro in the game winner. God, you know, we didn't even talk about that, but I mean, I, I've seen Eddie Pinero, and trust me, if, if it's past 35 yards, he ain't making it. It's just not <laughs> happening. Um, 35 yards in, um, uh, like in our chat today, Ricky said it was, you know, he, he'd make 50% of the kiss. It's going to be 50-50 from 35 in. 35 out, don't even freaking try it. <sighs> don't waste your time. Um, yeah, but – you know, as I always say, Randy, the sun has to shine on a dog's ass every once in a while. So there you go. G- good luck to you, Eddie. Yeah, uh, you got an official prediction? Did I miss that? I, I took the Saints 20 to 17. 20 cents. All right. Well, another barn burner in MetLife Stadium. Uh <laughs> All right, to continue with the early window, and this is a great game all of a sudden. In the NFC East, the Cowboys traveling to Landover, Maryland, to play a team representing the Washington. <laughs> so would it make sense of that however much you weigh? Uh, but the Washington football team now winners of four straight, I believe, now six and six, and now welcoming in Dallas towards eight and four. And this all of a sudden, if Washington wins this, they are right in the thick of it. And for the division, they hold the sixth seed now in the NFC playoff picture. I mean, Washington was dead to rights, but now they have ripped off a few victories here and beating the Bucks among them. I mean, I, I really think Washington is really kind of putting a nice run together here, um, but it may come to an end now with a good Cowboys team coming to town, but the Cowboys are pretty inconsistent at times as well. So you never really know. Uh, and these divisional games are always weird. I feel like FedEx field in December is home to some brutal moments. <laughs> Maybe November is what I'm thinking of, but you never know. Um, these two uh, teams typically play each other pretty tough and, and I'm excited to watch it. So um, Cowboys in Washington, I don't know which way to lean as of, at this point in time, uh, Matt Bushnell. I know my uh, future brother-in-law is going to this game. So I, he's a Cowboys fan. So I kind of rooting for him to lose, to be honest, just like, <laughs> uh, but <laughs> I don't know if that's really going to happen. I feel like, well, I don't know if I trust Washington enough. I, I don't trust Washington. I don't think Heineke puts the ball into too many dangerous spots. And with Trayvon Diggs having the year you have, I mean, so TJ Watt had three sack, three and a half sacks last week. Mm-hmm. Trayvon Diggs may come back and have three interceptions this week. <laughs> uh, I, I just don't trust Heineke in his ball placement. He throws it high, which is, you know, better than missing short, but still, you know, if, if they're playing those deep safeties or, you know, cover two, cover three, how, however they align that defense against, 
the Washington football team, it, it's going to be kind of yeah, yeah, iffy. I, I don't, I, I just think there's too much power, offensive firepower. I, I kind of said it before the year. I thought Dallas is offense was better than Washington's defense. And I still believe it. I, th- that hasn't changed, you know, chase young injury or not, you know, the Ewing theory, w- whatever theory we want to throw out. Well, they uh, haven't had Chase Young or Montez Sweat. So I don't think that's the case. I just think that Ron Rivera, to your point, figured out a way to rush the passer differently. I think those two injuries forced him to realize that they can rush the passer up the middle and not relying on those guys on the edge. So I really just think this was a coaching adjustment. Yeah. And, and I, trust me, I, I love Ron Rivera. It's been stated many a times on this podcast, how much, I love Ron Rivera, but this game is not going to matter. Um, g- give me Dallas 28 to Washington football teams 19. I guess it should be noted uh, that Heineke won't have one of his favorite targets in Logan Thomas. Uh, yeah. He just came back from injury, but he's now out for the season. Uh, I, I forgot what the injury was, but uh, he made a wonderful catch yep. <laughs> against the Raiders. Yeah, he, uh, he, he's not been ruled out for the season yet. They feared that it was a torn uh, ACL and MCL. Oh. Uh, but MRIs on Monday or today, I don't know, I, can't, I have to get my day straight here, but they showed no tears. Oh, okay. So maybe so, not done for the year. Yeah, but he's probably not going to that game, I assume. Uh, yeah, he's out. But Heineke threw a ball really high in the end zone, and Thomas was able to go up and get it somehow and keep his feet. And that was a great play. So he's not going to have his red zone threat. I know Ricky Seals Jones has made some plays this year, but it's not quite the same guy. Um, you're probably right. Dallas looks like they're getting healthy too. Amari Cooper looked like another week healthier. Lamb another week healthier. Uh, Michael Gallup really playing well after his injury now too. And the two-headed rushing attack, I think overall, it's going to be too much for Washington to handle. Give me the Cowboys. What was your score again? Uh, 28 to 19. 28, 19. That's a good score. Give me the Cowboys 31 to Washington's 26. Ooh. All right. Um, a couple more games left in the early window. Now it's the AFC, uh, NFC South, I should say. And two uh, overall just forgettable teams to me. The Falcons are now coming off of a loss to the Bucks, a 30 to 17. Uh, I think they're still technically in the hunt here because of how poor the back end of the NFC is. They're sitting at five and seven. And now they travel to Carolina, who's coming off of a bye. And they fired their offensive coordinator on Sunday during their bye week, which I feel like is a sign for Matt Rule to say, like, I feel like my seat's getting a little bit hotter here. So I'm putting some of the blame on you for my offense. Um, I gave you Sam Darnold and Cam Newton to work with, but hey, you know, I feel like it should have been better than that. So I think both of these teams are five and seven, actually. But, uh, you know, one of these teams is going to be relevant down the stretch. I feel like I trust the Falcons a little bit more, but honestly, I don't really like either of them. All right. I don't normally do this because I like to pick teams that have the better roster, but I'm going to take the team with the lesser roster, but with the better coach. And I'm going to take the Falcons here. I, I hate this. I really do. I, I think Matt Rule has shown me that he doesn't know anything. He, he's just a college guy, you know, and, and I hate to bash college coaches, but you fired Joe Brady. And if, if anybody wants to know the history on Joe Brady, go take a look at what LSU did with Joe Burrow. Now they had talent. <laughs> they had a lot of talent on that team. Justin Jefferson, I believe was an LSU tiger, gold tigers. Um, as was Jamar Chase, but I don't believe Jamar Chase played that year um, with Burrow just completely going off on everyone. I don't like what Rule did here because to me it lacks accountability. But we don't know what Joe Brady had. I'm sure it was Matt Rule's decision to go get Sam Darnold. I, mm-hmm. You know, that, that wasn't Joe Brady being consulted all the way on it. You know, but that's Matt Rule's guy now. So now you have Sam Darnold there, and basically you can say they fleeced, you know, the Jets fleeced Carolina because no matter what draft pick, if you got a seventh round draft pick from Carolina for Sam Darnold, you won the trade. Yeah. Um, Sam's just awful. It just stupid quarterback play, stupid decision making. And all of this just feels like it just piles up, piles up, piles up. Meanwhile, Arthur Smith is building some culture in Atlanta. They're feisty, they fight, you know, mm-hmm. even when they're outmanned. There's a lot of heart on that football team. And I, I like Arthur Smith. I do. I think he gets it. You know, they're trying to establish the run game here. So I'm, I'm going to take the Falcons here, Randy. And just a complete shocker in my, to my own system. Uh, <laughs> give, give me the Falcons 24 to 20. 
All right. Uh, in the NFC South, by the way, the Bucks sit at the top of that nine and three, and the Panthers, Falcons, Saints, all five and seven. Um, and the Falcons have a bottom four run, uh, bottom four point differential in the entire league at minus one sixteen. <laughs> not something I expected, but hey, I'm with down the Falcons. I just trust them more than the Panthers, who are going to roll out Cam Newton, who looks just like a complete shell of himself. Um, and they're clearly a different team without Christian McCaffrey, who is now done for the season. So. I, I just don't like where the Panthers are right now. And, and I, I don't know what Matt Ryan has left, but I think it's enough to win this game. And it should be noted. Uh, wait, is this game in Atlanta? Uh, no, it's in Carolina. The, the Falcons have a four and two record on the road and they're one and five at home. So they're a better road team than they are in Atlanta. So I, I think that gives a little bit more credence to our thoughts here. Give me the Falcons 25, 21 over the Panthers. And quick question. Um, yeah. Talking about your famous general manager for a second, coincidental that he drafted two running backs in the top 10 and both of them are just injury prone, never, and will never realize their full potential ever. I mean, he did it in back-to-back drafts. He drafted Christian McCaffrey seventh overall in 2017 and then drafted Saquon Barkley second overall in 2018. Someone take the keys away from Dave (laughs) Gettleman. Stop this madness. (laughs) I mean, I, I love I love CMC. You know, he's proven he's had a good year in the NFL, but he just can't stay healthy uh, for, for whatever it is. And mm-hmm. that's the thing with running backs. You just don't know. So, I mean, to me, I, I, I don't want to touch Saquon Barkley or CMC anymore. That's just damaged goods at this point. I mean, CMC helped win me a fantasy league in 2019. I will be forever grateful for that. Um, and I do think he is a good football player when he's on the field. Saquon Barkley doesn't look like a good football player anymore. Um, yeah, he, he just never also he, – he never played it to the level of CMC at his peak either. So yeah. I'm willing to give Bar- uh, uh, McCaffrey a little bit more slack than, than Saquon at this point. Yeah, sure. uh, all right, one last game in the early window here, and it is the Seattle Seahawks traveling to the Houston Texans. And the Seahawks coming off of a big upset – that your boy predicted on the show i said that they were going to beat the 49ers you're welcome sorry henry but you know you got to do it sometimes you got a gut feeling and sometimes it works out for you so then now the seahawks are four and eight traveling to houston who just got uh boat raced by the colts i think they got shut out even what was that what was the end of the final one what is that that final 31 nothing 31 nothing so outclassed by a team in their division um, so, uh, you know, I just feel like Seattle is going to do something similar. I don't think that Seattle is quite as good as the Colts, but I think they're much better at this point than, uh, Houston is. So I don't think we need to talk too much about it. Russell Wilson looked pretty good in that game. I would say, uh, the defense made a few plays that they needed to make and, uh, the Seattle won. So I think Seattle improves to five and eight here. Give me them, uh, 27 to Houston seven. Yeah. I, I don't think there's a whole lot to talk about here. I'm, I'm going to take Seattle 24 to Houston zero. It wasn't back-to-back shutouts uh, for the Texans. Okay. Uh, the Texans, uh, speaking of uh, point differentials, have the worst point differential in the NFL at minus 159. So, worse than the Lions. Uh, it's, you know, it's pretty good. Yeah. My, and, I, uh, all right. I, I, think the, I think the Lions have a better roster than the Texans. It's, it's calling Deshaun Watson. Where is Deshaun Watson? Yeah. Uh, now to the late games. And speaking of these Detroit Lions, I want my friend Leon Tompkins to be joining the show because, my friend, you have won a game. Congratulations to the Detroit Lions. Oh, 10 and 1, no longer. Now 1, 10 and 1. Jared Goff, whoever said you weren't clutch, my friend, uh, he threw a game winning touchdown pass to Amon Ross St. Brown as the clock expired. It is a walk off game winning touchdown pass for, for Jared Goff. I believe it's his first victory uh, with not Sean McVay, yeah. I, I think it was. Oh, yep. Uh, Definitely his first victory since the trade, but uh, his record with Sean McVay and without Sean McVay is pretty crazy. Um, so happy for the Lions fans. I'm happy for the people of Michigan who went through everything they went through in the last week. I really thought Dan Campbell had a nice moment after the game, uh, de- uh, dedicating the game ball to the victims of that school shooting in Michigan. Uh, I really think that was a great moment. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> Jared Goff is much maligned, and I don't think he's a great quarterback by any means, but this is a hell of a moment for him and for Dan Campbell. He immediately sprinted over and hugged Campbell after the game. That just shows that how hard they've all worked for this. Um, sorry to Lucas and all the other Vikings fans that it had to happen to you, but if it had to happen to somebody eventually. 
Uh, now the Lions get to travel to Denver to play the Broncos. Now, I don't know what to make of this because now are the Lions flying high? Are they about to rip off a little win streak here? Or yeah. is Denver going to say, hey, we lost to the Chiefs, but we're still light years better than Detroit and they're going to get off the stride and get back on track here and maybe still make a playoff push? Yeah, I mean, congratulations again, Detroit. Woo! Um, really, really, they should have beat the Bears. <laughs> they should have beat the Bears over Thanksgiving. They should already be on a win streak. Uh, I, I hate how Dan Campbell, you know, managed that game. It, yeah. it, was, it was awful. And he came back and he redeemed himself a little bit. I still don't know if he's the right guy. I, I think there's a lot of factors that go into something like this, but it's a culture thing. And I, I do like what he did with the culture. You know, it's, it's not really the same old lions because they don't have any talent, yeah. but at, at the end of the day, um, I'm going to say this, then I'm going to give a score. Um, with the tragedy that happened in Oxford, Michigan, you know, some things just feel right. And I'm glad that they won this game because, you know, two students didn't get to go home. You know, uh, four mm -hmm. parents didn't get to see their kids come home and say, I love you. Um, and, you know, uh, a staff at the school lost their life as well. And for them to be there and to say their names, to, you know, really send that powerful message, um, you know, good. It's, it's such a great moment for sports and organ, you know, an organization that always seems to get it wrong. You know, they got it wrong with Barry Sanders. They got it wrong with Calvin Johnson. Um, and, and hopefully this is the path, you know, something where they get it right. And it, it was a beautiful moment and I couldn't have been happier. Um, really well deserved by the Lions. With that being said, you know, Cinderella's carriage turned into a pumpkin and <laughs> th they're facing a different animal in this one. And the Broncos may not score many points, but I don't think the Lions are scoring any points. So <laughs> give me the Broncos 13 to nothing. Wow. Wow. Back-to-back -back shutouts been predicted by Matt Bush. That well, was the first time ever, I would say, on the show. Uh, to your point, uh, I, I just think Dan Campbell gets it. Yeah. I think the, between some of the other coaches, Matt Patricia and a lot of the other you know, people who have run the show there in Detroit have missed so many times. Uh, he took that opportunity to really – he understood the assignment. Like, he understood what, how big that moment was for that community. So, between Michigan on Saturday, uh, wearing the patches for the, the former player, wearing number 42, scoring 42 points, and the Lions getting that win, it was – sports has a way of of doing this to you where it just, just gives you chills and, and, and you know, brings some humanity to it as well. So, good for the Lions, great moment. Um, but I don't know how many more victories you have left in store for your season here. And that's okay because you get the number one pick get a damn good player in the meantime from maybe michigan you get, maybe yeah maybe you get a player from michigan like i was about to say aiden, aiden hutchinson could be the guy there that, that um, dude is real yeah he, very good player and he could be staying right in his backyard there so don't mess this up get the number one pick get your guy uh i do think Denver wins i don't think it's gonna be a shutout i don't want to disrespect the lions like that but uh give me the broncos 19 to 7 over the lions yeah and, and just to clear Felipe, I totally get your point. Um, basically, he said in the comments, technically, they got it right with Sanders and Johnson. Uh, you know, player acquisition, yes. And Stafford and yeah. Hawkinson, you know, he, Chris Spielman. Yeah, I mean, the, Herman Moore, mm -hmm. um, a, a lot of great players in the Lions organization. But more or less, this is how they treat their past players, how, yeah. how they fix those wounds. Um, you know, it, it's great that you can find those players and identify those players. But it, it's the what happens after that. Barry Sanders should have never retired at that point. They mishandled that situation. As a team, you want to find ways to make sure that that doesn't happen. Calvin Johnson should have never retired. I mean, we're talking maybe when it was all said and done, Calvin Johnson may have been the greatest wide receiver that ever would have played this game. He was mm -hmm. that special. And they screwed that up. You know, so at, at some point, you know, it needs to change. And it looks like they got a guy in a position of power to change some of this. And that, that's important. Yes, absolutely. And I give, a, I give the Giants a lot of shit 
um, for a lot of things. And a Sands Odell Beckham Jr., they really do a good job of treating their former players uh, well with respect and honoring them the right way. I mean, they held on to Eli Manning for three years too yeah. long because of his past success for the team. I mean, they retired Michael Strahan's number 13 years too late, but they still gave him his uh, due. I mean, eventually they always do it. And it's a tradition that, you know, the Giants have always done. So I give them a shit. I mean, they never even mentioned Odell Beckham Jr.'s name after the trade, which is something I still never really understand. But but um, for the most part, it's just some things you take for granted in that aspect because of how poorly the Lions have done. Like Calvin Johnson is willing to forgive them if they just said made one decision and they don't want to do it. It's, it's pretty crazy. Uh, you have such legendary players and they don't want to associate with you. So um, hopefully Dan Campbell can help fix some of that. Yeah, I, I think. So. And Felipe, because he brought this up, it reminds me almost of how Vince McMahon burned so many bridges with former WWE <laughs> legends and then Triple H tried, tried to rebuild those relationships and get those guys into the Hall of Fame. I wonder if Dan Campbell could be the Triple H in this instant and uh, kind of bring back some of these legends. You never know. Who knows? Yeah, it might have to be. Might have to be. All right. Uh, moving on with the late games here. We're going to go uh, to Cincinnati, Ohio, um, where the 49ers are coming off of a loss to the Seahawks. that we just talked about uh, they're now traveling to East of Skyline, Chile and play the Bengals, who also just lost a home game to the Los Angeles Chargers. So both these teams lost this. I don't know if you want to call this a loser leave town game, but uh, <laughs> the Bengals seven and five uh, right in the thick of the AFC playoff uh, race here. And the Niners, uh six and six they also have a, a chance to make the nfc wild card but hey whoever loses this game is in a much worse spot and totally cripples their chance to make the playoffs i think the Bengals are angry i think joe burrow is pissed by all the body language and all of his actions during the game I'll tell you that um and i think the Bengals are ready to just say hey we're good and we're ready to make the postseason and this isn't just like your old Bengals. so three things that are concerning to me for the 49ers Debo's out and you know we saw that on Sunday how much that affected the Niners and then Fred Warner is probably missing this game as well that is a huge injury I don't love the Niners secondary and offensively they're just they feel disjointed without Debo because I mean Debo is basically their one-man wrecking crew uh, Jimmy Garoppolo did hit um, Kittle on a touchdown pass which we haven't seen in a long time <laughs> Um, so Kittle can still be a difference maker, but I feel like when you go into Cincinnati, that defense is not bad. You know, Justin Herbert's an elite talent. Uh, Jimmy Garoppolo is not Justin Herbert. So we can cross that off right now. I like Cincinnati in this game. I, I don't think the 49ers are going to travel well without their biggest playmaker and Debo Samuel, Fred Warner, not playing. If that holds true, that is going to be significant especially against how Cincinnati likes to run their offense. They have a very nice running back in Joe Mixon. So he's going to be important. And I, I don't believe Nick Bosa, you know, I, I think you can neutralize Nick Bosa a little bit. So I'm going to take Cincy here, Randy. I, I think everything's aligning. What I saw from the 49ers game against the Seahawks was concerning. Seahawks are not a good football team right now. Russell Wilson's throws are not, you know, Obviously, he's got that finger that I think is still an issue. Joe Burrow's pinky finger is also an issue, but I believe that's on his non-throwing hand, though. So um, th that, that might help out as well. So I like Cincy a lot here. Give me Cincy. I think they're going to beat the 49ers 31 to 21. Yeah, I think the Bengals really shot themselves in the foot on several occasions in that Chargers game. They finally come back. I think it's 22 to 20 after a couple of Chargers turnovers and they're driving and then Joe Mixon fumbles the handoff and the Chargers pick it up and return it back for a touchdown. And then they were finished the game. I believe they scored 18 unanswered or something like that, but it was a weird game. And I, I think, you know, you saw the frustration on Joe Burrow's face. He hurt his finger in that game. Uh, at the end of the half, I've never seen this before, but he tried to rush to throw a Hail Mary. And I think it would think he wanted to hike it. And as time expired, he just left the clock run out. And then he unstrapped it all angry, started yelling at the sideline. My only guess is that they're still in his head at that point. They, they can still talk to him because there's still enough time on the play clock that you're allowed to. Yeah. And then they just said, don't, don't, don't snap it. Don't snap it. Like Joe, don't snap it. Like, and then he got really angry. So um, they, they pulled the chargers. Honestly, I, I expect that more from the chargers, uh, but it ended up being the Bengals this time around. But to your point, 
I don't trust the Niners right now. No, no uh, Samuel out there. Their secondary is banged up. You see the frustration building with Kyle Shanahan about Jimmy Garoppolo too. He oh, threw man. a brutal interception in this game. They cut away to Shanahan right at the perfect time. He like rolled his eyes and got all mad because you could tell Jimmy made a huge mistake. And in the, the safety, if you had a guy with a little bit more mobility, a little bit more self-awareness, you don't take a sack in that spot and you are able to get rid of the ball at the very least. And he couldn't, he got sacked, safety. That's a momentum shifter. Absolutely game changer and that came after a brutal pick after a drop from Gerald Everett so I think Kyle Shanahan understood the moment in that time that they could have really established themselves as one of these NFC playoff teams and now it's going to slip away and I think it continues to do that here I like the Bengals roster I like they have a ton of talent and I don't think the defense is half bad either give me Cincy uh, I like them 34 to uh, 23 over the 49ers now we get to talk about my team unfortunately <laughs> um, the New York football giants uh, coming off of a brutal loss to the Miami Dolphins get to go to LA to play those charters uh, and Justin Herbert and the quarterback that could have been what could have been um, and uh, was just killing it with them and the Giants uh, now four and eight on the season they Mike Glennon believe it or not didn't get the job done they lose 20 to nine over the Dolphins and just really it's not even like that. You don't expect to win with your backup quarterback and you have some injuries and stuff. Just the coaching staff does not do a good job of putting these players in a position to succeed. And I, we talked about how Belichick just, you know, did everything he could to put his players in a position to succeed. Joe judge now has three of the most cowardly punts in the last 20 years of the NFL. He punted in this game twice on fourth and short on the Dolphins side of the field when you have nothing to lose, you have your four and seven. Like, what is the, why are you punting to put for, for, for field position? It, it, it is. I'm so, I, I, he lost me. I, I'm over Joe judge. He's done with me. I know they're not going to fire him unless they lose out and I get embarrassed throughout the rest of the season, which I don't know if that necessarily happens, but boy, oh boy, Joe judge, the philosophy here is flawed and it's a conservative one that I'm not the biggest fan of. And now this, this is even worse here. Well, Daniel Jones' neck injury, um, he looks like he'll be out a few more weeks, if not season ending. They are seeing a specialist to determine that this week. And then your boy, Mike Lennon, comes in to fill in. And now he got diagnosed with a concussion. So he is out unless he can clear concussion protocol in time, which doesn't seem likely for Sunday. Do you want to know who the Giants quarterback one is? Jake Fromm, who was just the fourth string quarterback on the Bills two weeks ago. My oh my, this just if you're a Giants fan, you need to sit back and just remember how great it was to have Eli Manning as your quarterback for 16 years because this is something you never ever had to worry about. <sighs> Man, this Giants season is over, and I'm personally thrilled because that means people are going to get fired, but at the same time, you don't want this level of embarrassment. And I really just hope if it is going to be poor at the end of the season and they get blown out and they lose every game, fire Joe Judge too, blow it up, let's start from scratch. Any thoughts on this game, Matt Bush? Anything you want to add from the Chargers side of things? Chargers 44, Giants 10. <laughs> no other thoughts for Matt Bush. Uh, 44, that would be bad for the Giants defense. We're going to find out, though. If, if Judge loses the locker room, if Patrick Graham somehow lost the defense, that's what will happen. I don't know if that's happened quite yet, but I do think the Chargers are just better. Give me the Chargers 27 to 6 over the Giants. I think Graham Gano makes two 50 plus yarders, and that's the only way the Giants score. They also have scored more points via field goal than any team in the league. I haven't even talked about that. <laughs> they, they were all, they settle for field goals so often. It's so ridiculous. I can't stand it. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I would like to give the Giants some more love. I mean, Tua, you know, really played a really good game yeah. against them. I, I loved what Tua did. My issue is this whether it's Glennon, he sucks. Whether it's Fromm, he sucks even more. You're going against a Chargers team that put up 41 points on the freaking Bengals, and the Bengals have a decent. I, I would take the Bengals defense over the Giants defense. Um, Bengals can generate pressure and they can yeah. get to the quarterback. The Giants cannot. The, the Giants are are a better tackling team, I think. Um, and the better part, secondary on the Giants, I would say, but that's about it. Yeah, yeah, but 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 the Bengals front four is so much better than the Giants front four. You give Justin Herbert time to diagnose. I mean, they're going to slice and dice. One thing I will say, though, for your benefit here, Randy, Keenan Allen's out. Yes, I was so, just going to say that. So that may save you. I, I may have to come back. You know, I, I will I will come back down a little. It's going to be 34 to 10, the Chargers. 
<laughs> Donald Parham instead just lights it up for a little bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah, not totally concerned. I think, you know, they're still going to have a nice day. So, um, all right, moving on to the last of these late games. And it's, I mean, this could be the game of the day and it could be the Bills season on the line here. But Buffalo now travels. They don't have to deal with the same windy cold temperatures they deal at home because they're going to Tampa Bay, Florida to play their old nemesis, Tom Brady and the Buccaneers. And the Bucks coming off of a 30 to 17 win over the Falcons. And as we talked about earlier, the Bills losing that game last night, uh, 14 to 10 against the hated Patriots. Not going to lie, this feels like the Tom Brady MVP late season push. Uh, and I like the Bucks big in this spot. And the Bills feel like a little bit of a mess right now. You know, I don't normally like to gloat on the show very often, but I told everyone Tom Brady was going to win the MVP this year. Like it was set up so perfectly for Tom Brady and Buffalo. You had to play Tom Brady for 20 years in your division and he ruined your season for 20 years. He's going to ruin your season again. You thought he left and you thought you would never have to have him ruin your season ever again. But guess what? With Tampa Bay, he's going to ruin it one more time. I just, the Bucks are really good. They're better. The, the offense is so well run. And I, I give credit to Brady on that because Brady is so precise, so cerebral when it comes to like, everything's got to be this way. When you have a quarterback that that's much of a leader, it's like, even if you're one yard off, you know, we have a standard here where it doesn't matter if it's a foot or an inch. If you're not in the spot that you're supposed to be, I'm going to let you know about it. And that's unacceptable. That's what Brady brings to this team. The Bucs, to me, are getting healthy. They're getting better on defense. I, I, I just I, I like everything I see from them. Outside of the Antonio Brown fiasco with the fake COVID card, turns out, Randy, and I, I have to see if I can validate this story. He got a fake COVID card. He started feeling worried. So in late August, he went to go get vaccinated. <laughs> So the mm -hmm. NFL had a fake card on him for on file, but he was vaccinated when yeah. this investigation was taking place. Just some of the dumb shit uh, of all the dumb things. Like Antonio Brown, what the hell is wrong with you? But you gotta clear that conscious man, that con conscious the whole thing. <laughs> and this guy has one of all the people in the of NFL. All the people. Antonio Brown. So I I think he didn't want to disappoint his mentor and Tom Brady. I think Tom Brady was ready to kill him. Um, but I, I like the Bucks here. The Bills, to me, you know, Josh Allen could have all these cerebral things said about him. He's got this big arm. He could throw across the wind. It doesn't matter in any weather condition. It's all about Josh Allen. Well, guess what? Tom Brady is Tom Brady. He's got seven Super Bowl rings for a reason. It's not by mistake. I think the Bucks win this one, Randy, 28 to 27. Oof. I mean, it sounds like a great game to me. Uh, a few notes on the Bucks. Brady now leads the NFL in passing yards and passing touchdowns. And Leonard Fournette leads all running backs in reception. So who, who saw that coming? Uh, Leonard Fournette has been great for the Bucks. Yeah. I mean, it really has been. Um, I still think Aaron Rodgers uh, is going to win MVP. My only concern with my, that prediction is that the I don't know if the NFL writers are going to vote him MVP considering all of the back stuff. Um, you know, he missed a game because of that. So they might hold that against him. So I could see, you know, being Brady by default. But um, to me, Rodgers has been, you know, the most valuable player in the league this year. So, I mean, it could be TJ Watt. If we're talking about non-quarterbacks, I think TJ Watt is up there, but uh, they're not going to give it to it. And Jonathan player. Taylor, too. Let's not forget about how great Jonathan Taylor's been. You're right. You're right. You're right. Um, yeah, I like the Bucks in this game. Um, I just, I, I don't think the Bills have what it takes right now. So uh, I will say Tampa 27 to the Bucks 24, or to Bills 24. A great game, man. I, I think we both expect. We have high expectations. Do not let us down, Tampa Bay and Buffalo. Yeah, come on. Entertain us, damn it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a wrap for the late games prime time time uh now matt bushnell and it's your chicago bears traveling to the frozen tundra of lambeau field no. to play the green bay packers and boy oh boy this every time they do this game in prime time i just wonder why <laughs> Because I feel like it's always not as good of a game as it could have been. And Rodgers ends up coming out on top. So um, I guess I'll just say, give me the Packers in this game. Give me them 27. All I want is Justin Fields. Give me Justin Fields and I'll be fine. Uh, give me the Packers uh, 27 to the Bears uh, 16. Matt, what do, you, what do you think? 
I, I don't even want to fucking talk about this shit. Um, so I, I, I shared a tweet in our group chat. Um, Alex Shapiro, who's a reporter for you know NBC Sports, talked to Darnell Mooney. And Darnell Mooney, who's a wide receiver at the Chicago Bears, has said, no, Justin Fields, if, if there's any pain, we're not seeing it in practice. He looks great. And Matt Nagy does what typical Matt Nagy bullshit that he does. It has went on the podium and said two weeks ago that, or w- w- with the Lions game, it's just a pain tolerance thing to just pain tolerance a- a- after the Viking or after the Lions game. So basically, you know, he put all this on Justin Fields, insinuating that Justin Fields isn't tough enough to handle this. Keep in mind, Justin Fields is the guy who broke his ribs against Clemson and went back in and proceeded to throw six touchdown passes in the college football playoff, then went to go play Alabama. If there's one thing I don't question about Justin Fields is his pain tolerance and his toughness, but this idiot fucking coach has done it again. Like he was told, there was a report out that he told, he was told by George McCaskey, the principal owner of the Chicago Bears, Virginia's his mom, to start Justin Fields, bench Dalton. And guess what? We got to see the Andy Dalton show on full effect against the Arizona Cardinals, who in my opinion, like one of the top two teams in the NFL this year, absolutely obliterate the bears four interceptions for dalton and this is the guy that Nagy wants so are we going to see justin fields on sunday night probably not because this is matt Nagy's middle finger to ownership and i hope they fire his ass after this game because i'm sick of this shit as a bears fan you know at, at least with your giants randy they don't actively sabotage their fucking quarterbacks they, they, they don't go out not of their way <laughs> not on purpose just enough to two <laughs> Matt Nagy has gone out of his way to make life as difficult as possible on Justin Fields. And I don't care anybody can say whatever, you know, if you don't like Justin Fields, if you like whatever better, you got to see Andy Dalton. No one better say a damn word to me that Andy Dalton's better than Justin Fields. You are on fucking crack. After watching that, I'll tell you what, Randy, it should have been more than four interceptions. It should have been fucking six. This guy, I'm, I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. Andy Dalton is a bum ass quarterback who happens to be a redheaded ginger who needs to go. You know, I, I, I've seen enough of it. I don't need to see him more in Chicago, but guess what? We're going to see him for this Packers game. I bet, I bet you Dalton starts against green Bay and I'm predicting green Bay to beat the bears 44 to 10. God, if it's Dalton, I have to change my prediction to like 52 to 13 or something like that. <laughs> if it's Dalton, I, he's I, just I, atrocious. I don't even want to watch this fucking like, I don't know why. Uh, if I was the leaders of NBC, there's no way this game would have stayed where it was at. There is absolutely no reason. I, I don't think the Bucks could have got moved because they've been on prime time. I think the max is five, five or six. The, the Bucks yeah. have been on prime time as much as they can be on prime time. I would have put, I would have put Dallas and Washington in this spot. Yeah. Any other game, any other game, like at what point have you not seen enough Bears Packers game to know how this is going to play out? Aaron Rodgers is going to go like for, I don't know, let's say 27 for 34, 310 yards and four touchdowns in his sleep. It's the same damn story. Every time these teams play at Lambeau field, 300 yards, four touchdown passes for Rodgers, no interceptions. This game sucks. <laughs> there are some quarterback issues in Green Bay. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this oh, today. Yeah, but, uh, Aaron Rodgers can't pra- practice. Yeah, he can't practice on his fractured toe. Uh, I believe the, um, the uh, love situation is he's on the COVID list, I think I saw. Um, so what was the quarterback's name that they called up? I, I want to get this right because this is the guy that you might have a chance to beat. Uh, Packers, QP, let's see. Uh, Why do we think Aaron Rodgers is not playing? Well, I just want to give you some hope. I wanted to make no, 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 no. I don't want any hope. I, 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 I want the Bears to lose as embarrassingly as possible, so this nightmare of Matt Nagy can be over. I'm done with this idiot. He, he's a, a shitty person and a worse coach. Uh, Packers elevate quarterback Kurt Benkart. Benkart. So you could be facing Kurt Benkart. Yeah, in the in the fourth quarter when the Packers are winning thirty eight to nothing. Okay. Hey, keep losing. It only helps my Giants have a better draft pick. So, um, you know, I support your disdain for the Bears. And uh, I just want to watch Justin Fields. I I, I yeah. want to see what these rookie quarterbacks have, and I, I want to see what he's got. And um, we had a little bit of conversation about David Montgomery in the chat that you got mad at me about. I want to watch well, David Montgomery more. Well, yeah, I, no, I think I, he's a good player, but I want to watch him more. 
You know, I, you know, I, I think there's things with David Montgomery that a lot of people don't see, and that's fair. Like, like you guys are absolutely right to question me on anything you want to question me on. <laughs> you know, my, my stance is I, I've seen a lot of tape of a lot of running backs in the NFL. As an overall player, as an overall running back, and I'll stand by it and I'll take all the heat for it. I, I do believe Devin Montgomery is a top five running back in the NFL for the total things that he brings to the table. Dalvin Cook is not a great blitz pickup running back. He misses a lot of blitz pickups. Um, you know, CMC's hurt all the time, and I, I just don't like that. Now, Jonathan Taylor, Derrick Henry, absolutely. I mean, those, those guys are the cream of the crop, deserve to be up there. This idiot Nagy, and just to go back to it, <laughs> David Montgomery had a 12-yard carry. They pull him out of the game after a 12-yard carry. Like, this is consistent. Six-yard carry out of the game. Like, it's, it's frustrating, man. David Montgomery should be touching the ball 35 times a game, whether it's a combine of runs and cast receptions. It's, this offense is stupid. I'm sick of it. I would just like to watch Fields and Montgomery together with some Mooney. I think the Bears have potential to be uh, be entertaining if they would just let themselves be. But uh, nonetheless, if we get any adult, it's going to be a game where I just put on a movie or something instead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you should. All right. Monday Night Football, and it's a good one. Uh, it is an NFC West uh, showdown between the first place Cardinals at 10 and 2, first place in the NFC playoff picture against the Rams, who are now 8-4, who finally got off the schneid with a dominating win over the Jags. Um, I, I'm not going to take away too much from the win over Jacksonville. It's Jacksonville. I said the same thing about the Niners when they won that game. I can't take away too many things. But the Rams could erase a lot of their problems here if they were able to somehow get a win over the Cardinals. I just don't see it because Kyler's back. DeAndre Hopkins is back. And the Cardinals look as good as, as any team in the NFL, quite frankly. So the Rams got to show that to me, that they're capable of winning this kind of game. And I don't know if I trust them right now to do so. So the weather was really crappy in Chicago for the Cardinals. Um, the, the Rams had a really nice game, you know, in Jacksonville or against Jacksonville and, you know, perfect weather. Um, I, I think that Murray and Hopkins knocked off some of that rust. James Conner looks really good. Like he looks yeah. really, really good. And they're going to get Edmonds back this week. Yeah, I just, I, I, I think this is the game the Cardinals win. I, I, I think this is where they plant their flag as the number one team in the NFC. Um, you know, Tampa Bay, I believe, has four losses already. So, you know, they, they need, or three, I'm three, sorry, nine and, three. nine and three. Yeah. So this is a game where Arizona wins, and I think they plant their flag. Uh, it firmly cements them as the NFC West champions. So go ahead and give me the rank or the Cardinals. 31 to the Rams 29. I think this is going to be a great game. Yeah. Uh, this is the second straight week where I feel like the best game is on Monday night football. Um, you know, I don't think the Pats and Bills <laughs> panned out the way we expected. I think the win had a lot to do with that, but I do think they were two good teams. These two teams are both really good. And uh, I just, if the Rams can come out and win this game, it'll shift how I feel about the NFC altogether for the playoffs because I, I will not trust the Cardinals, which I have my, my doubts with Kingsbury now, but it's hard to doubt what they put the, on paper so far this year. I mean, the, the tape is the tape, but you put on tape is what you are, and the Cardinals have as good a tape as any team in the league right now. Um, and you know, if it goes through Arizona, I don't know how many teams in the NFC are going to be totally mad that they get to go play in a dome yeah. in Arizona in the playoffs. Like, <laughs> I mean, look, I know it's an advantage for the Cardinals because they're home, but, you know, the Green Bay is not going to be mad about it. I don't think any of the other uh, – the Rams aren't going to be mad about it. The Bucks aren't going to be mad about it. And these teams who play outdoor northern stadiums are the teams that they just, just other teams don't want to play. Yeah. <laughs> the Cardinals, I don't know how strong it is, but I don't think other teams are really shaking in their boots if they have the one seed. But, yeah, like to your point, Kyler looked like he got some rust taken off a little bit. Connor has been a godsend for them. And Hopkins, uh, I think he's touchdown dependent overall, but he's still a playmaker nonetheless the Cardinals are stacked offensively I agree with you this is going to be the game of the week give me the Cardinals 37 to the bear uh the bears the Rams 35 love it love it and I can't wait I can't wait to watch it 
Can't wait. All right. Well, before well, that's that's week 14. But hey, before we say goodbye, we got some college football to talk about. We briefly touched on it at the end of the last show how there's some coaches moving on to other places. But now we know what the college football playoff has in store for New Year's Eve that Friday in a few weeks. Um, and this comes, I mean, if you asked me, I would have told you Georgia was the cream of the crop in college football this year. And they played Alabama in the SEC title game on Saturday and got boat raced. <laughs> Nick Saban is Satan, as you have said so many times. Uh, but him and Belichick are just unbelievable coaches that are on a different level from the rest of them. Um, so now Alabama is your one seed, followed by Michigan, the two seed, the Big Ten champs, followed by the George Bulldogs, who I just mentioned lost to Alabama. They're only lost the season as the three seed. And then the Cincinnati Bearcats, number four seed in, <laughs> in the playoff after winning their conference as well. I uh, love to see the Bearcats getting in there over some other teams. Uh, we look, that four, that, that whoever plays Alabama most likely is going to get blown out anyway. Why don't you give a smaller school a chance to uh, to get in? So I love that Cincinnati's in. Don't know if it matters much uh, for the results of the playoffs. It feels like it's going to be another rematch of the SEC title game in the championship game for college football um but maybe i'm underestimating michigan a little bit who knows matt what are your thoughts on the 2021 college football playoff bracket i like it i i agree full heartedly with it i know a lot of people were kind of butt hurt mainly a lot, a lot of michigan alums that michigan didn't get moved up to one let's just face it um what alabama puts on tape is so much better than what anyone can do uh, I thought Georgia was unbeatable this year. I'm like, man, you know, Georgia's the thing. And then Alabama just rolls in there and just beats the living bejesus out of them. Bryce Young is fantastic. Like, watch that kid play the quarterback position. He he gets it, man. Randy, he's got some fantastic touch on the passes. Like, he, he just lays it in there, easy to catch. To me, I just go back to, I don't think – that anybody beats Alabama. I'm tired of trying to convince myself that someone's going to beat Nick Saban. I do think Michigan beats Georgia, though. I, I think Michigan's uh, – Hutchinson's going to be the best player on the field in the next two games that is played if, if they win this game against Georgia. Hutchinson's that good. We're talking Bosa-level good. We're talking T.J. Watt good. Um, the kid's got elite takeoff. But I, I do believe they got it right, and I'm looking forward to seeing it. And, you know, just for my prediction, I, I will take Alabama over Michigan to win the national title. Wow. <clears throat> I guess the only thing I have concerns, because I think Georgia is much – I think Georgia should be the best player, best team in the, in the playoff. But after what Alabama did, did that crush them beyond no recovery? Because – this was the year everyone said if the Georgia is on the national title this year, it's never happening for them. They got boat raced by, by Bama in Georgia at freaking the Falcons home stadium. Like they had the home field advantage and everything. And they still got smoked and the game wasn't particularly close really at all. Um, so I wonder if that's a huge confidence, you know, uh, confidence crusher. Um, I think Georgia's better than Michigan. If they beat Michigan and they beat Michigan handily, I, I could convince convince myself they could beat Alabama again. I know that's silly. I know I will be wrong, but I'm just I don't want Alabama to win the damn title again. Uh, I would like some other team to win. And I, I do like Georgia. I, I like Kirby Smart, but he got out coached like crazy in that game. And it's hard for me to have confidence. For your sake, I hope you're right. I hope we have a different title game. If it's Michigan, Alabama, at least it's something new. Uh, I know we typically have Ohio State in this spot. So it'd be nice. To, it'd be cool to see Jim Harbaugh on there. Uh, to see how he does up against Alabama. I don't think he's faced Alabama uh, no. in his as the coach of Michigan, right? No, nope, he hasn't because usually Alabama's in the national title game and Michigan's not. Yeah, well, usually they're playing in the Rose Bowl or something. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, I guess Alabama-Michigan would be an intriguing matchup uh, just because we haven't seen it before. I would just like to see how those two teams face off. But I have a feeling we're going to get that SEC title game all over again, and I just hope – Hope, hope Georgia can step up and uh, make it a better game than the one we saw on Saturday. And I think the whole country, for the first time ever, is pulling for Cincinnati, Ohio. <laughs> I would love for the Bearcats to pull up the upset. Uh, if, if Cincinnati wins that game, I will eat a bowl of Skyline chili on this show. I promise you, I will be that happy. All right. uh, it's not going to happen, but I, I would be very happy. Yeah, so there you have it. Uh, college, I think they got it right, too, for the record. Um, yeah. Alabama won. Maybe Georgia, I think you've earned that. Um, Michigan, too, doesn't bother me at all. 
Um, and then Cincinnati, if you don't think Cincinnati deserved it, I don't know what to tell you. Notre Dame had their chances and they came up short and then Oklahoma state probably had a great chance too. And they fell short to Baylor and that was a great ending to that game, but you know, they lose. So you don't, you don't get in if you lose. Ultimately, that's how this goes. All right. Well, episode 82 now in the books, Matt Bushnell, but before we go, we have a long group of a uh, podcast under this life group umbrella that we, uh, we all love and we all put a lot of effort into. So why don't you tell us about them? If on, um, I'm not sure if Dong City is going Wednesday. I don't know Dong City schedule, but with Vince Mercadetti and Henry Maldonado Jr. Love those two guys. Baseball is kind of in a weird spot with the lockout. So, you know, watch it if it's on. And then we have <laughs> Thursday, the Work Shoot Wrestling Podcast with Jason Brooks and Corey Richmond. Love those guys. Wrestling, always a hot topic. Ball is Life with Leon Tompkins and Jacob Anthony Moses. Love those guys. They will be singing some Bulls praise with the Bulls just really just handling business, baby. Not a big basketball guy when the Bulls suck, but when the Bulls are good, I'm all in, baby. And then we have uh, Felipe Melicio, who has a rotating guest of partners with Austin, seems to be the latest, latest one. But check those guys out Sunday morning, Monday, around those times. Definitely. I think Dog City is probably off. Baseball is in a really bad spot. So uh, those guys might be on a uh, bi-weekly schedule. Uh, I know Leon and Jacob certainly won't be talking about my Lakers uh, on the Step Back pod because uh, there's uh, not not a ton to talk about there. I'm just kidding. Um, but it is basketball life now, just so you guys know, if you're watching this or listening to this, you want to join our basketball group, it's basketball life uh, has been rebranded. So uh, all right. Well, I want to thank everybody for watching us this week on in football life or on YouTube, or if you're listening to us on our audio only platforms, uh, I want to take you know, just thank you for taking a part of your day and wherever you may be just to listen to us for just a little bit. Uh, you know, me, Matt and I greatly appreciate us. Uh, appreciate you hanging out with us every Tuesday night. Uh, Matt holiday season. Now uh, you have any parting words for the audience? Enjoy the family. Indeed. Enjoy the family as well. Uh, on behalf of Matt Bush, I'm Randy Hammond saying see you guys next week. Be safe.